Good evening aspirants, welcome to the Hindu News Analysis by Shankar IAS Academy for the date 22nd of November 2022. Displayed here are the list of news articles we will be going through today. Now without wasting time, let's get into the news article discussion. Take a look at this article. It reports about the total value of assets monetized by the National Monetization Pipeline in the financial year 2022-23. The total worth of assets monetized is rupees 33,423 crores, out of which nearly 17,000 crores is contributed by the coal ministry alone. This is about the news article. In this context, let us revise about the National Monetization Pipeline. The idea of National Monetization Pipeline was first mooted by our Finance Minister in the 2021-22 budget. Union Budget 2021-22 has identified monetization of operating public infrastructure assets as a key means for sustainable infrastructure financing. So, the budget provided for the preparation of a National Monetization Pipeline of potential brownfield infrastructure assets. Here, I have mentioned about two terms which are monetization and brownfield. Let us see what these terms mean to get a complete understanding about national monetization pipeline. First, let us take monetization. Monetization literally means to convert something into money. In practice, this means turning idle assets into revenue generating ones. Now moving on to brownfield. The term brownfield refers to the assets which are already in a developed stage from which revenue generation can be done easily. The opposite of brownfield is greenfield. In this type, the assets are not completely developed. The buyers or the leasers has to spend certain amount of money and time to generate revenue from the greenfield assets. So I hope you understand the difference between brownfield and greenfield. Here note that Indian government is trying only to monetize brownfield assets of it and not the greenfield ones. Also note that monetization in the sense of national monetization pipeline only means leasing out and not outright selling of the assets. Make note of these two points. These two points can be asked in your prelims examination. So from this we can see that our union government is planning to monetize unutilized and underutilized brownfield assets of it to generate money which can be used for funding future infrastructure projects. The Niti Aayog in consultation with various ministries have identified potential brownfield assets which can be monetized for the national monetization pipeline. Here note that the union government is planning to mobilize nearly 6 lakhs crores through the national monetization pipeline by the year 2025. It is an ambitious target. Let us wait and see whether the government is able to achieve it or not. Okay. Now let us end our discussion by seeing an example of national monetization pipeline. Let us take an area X. In this area, assume that Indian Railways has an unutilized warehouse which is fully developed. At the same area X, a private organization is looking for a warehouse. This is when National Monetization Pipeline comes into action. Our union government will give this already developed but not utilized warehouse of the Indian Railways to the private entity for some years for lease and the generated money in this transaction will be brought into the National Monetization Pipeline which will then be used to fund the National Infrastructure Pipeline. This is how National Monetization Pipeline works. We will cover about this National Infrastructure Pipeline in our future videos. Okay. With this, we have come to the end of this discussion. I hope you have understood about the National Monetization Pipeline as I explained it in detail. So with this, let us conclude this and take up the next news article. Take a look at this article. It reports that the central government is bringing out a standard for publishing product reviews on e-commerce platforms from 25th November. The article also says that the framework for the standard was prepared by the Bureau of Indian Standards. Here see that the framework is brought to safeguard the consumer interest from the fake and deceptive reviews on e-commerce platforms. This is about the news article given here. In this context, let us learn about the issue of fake review and also about the Bureau of Indian Standards in prelims perspective. See, in the age of e-commerce, a product's success depends on the review it holds on the website of its e-commerce platform. The seller, knowing this, try to maximize their profit by writing fake reviews on their own products, which will ultimately trick the consumer to buy the product. So, to keep a check 
on this practice and to bring in the necessary transparency to boost consumer confidence indian government has brought in this regulation framework this is about the rational behind the introduction of new framework and the issue of fake review see i was actually very happy after seeing this news because even i was also duped by a fake review just i am sharing a personal story here during my preparation days when i was staying in delhi for a vacation we planned a trip to mcladganj after extensive search in trip advisor we booked a hotel we paid the amount and we confirmed the booking but when we arrived at mcladganj to our surprise the hotel was locked actually it was sealed when we asked the owner he said us to come from a door which was behind the entrance when we went inside there was no water supply and even no electricity after fighting with the owner the owner allowed us to stay in the room but without electricity and water but we had no other go he was not giving us our money back so we spent two days in our trip without any water or without any electricity so a fake review can lead to such disastrous condition so i was personally very happy that the government is planning to regulate and address the issue of fake reviews enough about my personal history now let's go back to the discussion now let us see about the bureau of indian standards bureau of indian standards is the national standards body of india it is a statutory body established under an act of the parliament here note that the bureau of indian standards actually replaced the indian standards institutions and all the functions of the indian standards institutions is now carried on by the bureau of indian standards bureau of indian standards was set up for the development of activities of standardization marking and quality certification of good products the term standardization here refers to the process of creating standards to guide the creation of a good or a service this is what the article also reports if you can recollect here the bureau of indian standards is trying to standardize the mechanism of publishing online reviews in the e-commerce websites to filter out fake reviews okay now coming back let us see the history of bureau of indian standards initially bureau of indian standards was set up by the bureau of indian standards act 1986 but then in 2016 a new bureau of indian standards act 2016 was notified this act reinforces the activities of the bureau of indian standards in respect to standardization and certification of goods and articles processes systems and services note that formalization of indian standards is one of the core activities of the bureau of indian standards the standards cover important segments of the economy these standards help the industries in upgrading the quality of their products and services and also help promoting standardization of goods and services present inside our economy so this is about the bureau of indian standards in this discussion we saw about the new initiative of our central government and also we saw about the bureau of indian standards for our prelims perspective with this let us conclude this and take up the next news article we are going to take this opad article for our next discussion this article says that the supreme court has asked the center to respond to the plea of subramanian swami subramanian swami is a member of parliament of rajya sabha and his request is to make ram setu a national heritage site and the article also talks about the controversial setu samitram ship channel project and the importance of ram setu so in this discussion we will see them one by one before that i have highlighted here the syllabus regarding this discussion you can go through it first of all let us start the discussion with the controversial setu samitram ship channel project you should know what this project is about right the setu samitram ship channel project envisages dredging of a ship channel across the palk strait between india and sri lanka here dredging means the removal of sediments and debris from the bottom of the lake rivers harbors etc so basically it is the removal of sediments and debris from water bodies and why it is done dredging is focused on maintaining or increasing the depth of navigation channels so it is done to ensure the safe passage of ships and boats now think about the setu samutram project why the setu samutram project aims to dredge a ship channel between india and sri lanka what is the significance of it to know that we should see some geography see this image here the highlighted region here is only setu samutram it is nothing but a sea that separates india from sri lanka as you can see the highlighted region is separating the landmass of india and sri lanka but the problem here is the depth 
see this image here the sedu samutram sea is in light green color and the surrounding water body is in dark blue color so this color variation indicates that sedu samutram sea is having low depth and the reason for this low depth is the presence of shallow regions known as adams bridge it is highlighted in this image here in light green color again it is a chain of limestone shoals and shoals are nothing but places where a sea river or other water body is shallow so here limestone shoal indicates shallow water with limestone which are potentially corals the bridge is 50 km long and as you can see in this image it separates the gulf of mannar from the palk strait it is located southeast of rameshwaram near pamban and it connects the talai mannar coast of sri lanka here an interesting thing is that it is also known as ram setu See this bridge was mentioned in Valmiki's Ramayana. In Hindu mythology it is believed that the bridge was built by Lord Rama's Vanarasena. It was built for Lord Ram to rescue his wife Sita from Sri Lanka. It is based on the Hindu epic Ramayana. Just know about it. Now let us come back. We saw that Sedu Samitram Sea is shallow and it connects India with Sri Lanka and it is made of limestone shoals. Now you may ask what is the problem with that? Many water bodies in the world are shallow, right? So what is the issue with this Sedu Samitram Sea alone? I understand your doubt, but as a UPSC aspirant, you have to think about it in all different angles. So think about it in a economic angle. All the oil supplies from the Middle East are shipped from ports of red sea or persian gulf to the southeast and southeast asia their sea lanes converge in the arabian sea and pass through the gulf of mannar after that they curve off the west southern and southwestern coast of sri lanka afterwards they curve off the west southern and southeastern coast of sri lanka this sea lane then turns northeast through the bay of bengal towards the malacca strait 80% of japan's oil supplies and more than 60% of china's oil supplies are shipped on this shipping lane almost half of the world's container traffic passes through the choke points of this sea lanes in indian ocean but think no what necessitated this long route it is the adams bridge only right with a depth of less than 10 meter across most of the extent the sea is not sufficient for the movement of ships otherwise ships can easily sail through sedu samudram and through palk strait and it can reach malacca strait and this is the only problem with this shallow water region if this sea is deepened then the sea traffic will pass through the indian territorial waters and it is a major economic gain for india i mean it will lead to considerable savings and earnings of foreign exchange other than the world of sea traffic and economic gains this deepening of shallow sea will reduce lot of expenditure for our country also think about it india does not have a continuous navigation channel connecting the east and west coast right currently ships coming from west coast of india have to navigate around sri lanka coast to reach the east coast of india so if this sea channel is established india will have a well developed maritime connection between the east and west coast ships does not have to go through the marine waters of sri lanka this will result in substantial savings for the shipping companies exporters importers and manufacturers and this is what is envisaged in the sedu samitram ship channel project the project will create an unavoidable bypass that would inevitably divert the sea traffic through india's own maritime waters this is one of the significance of the project other than this this project has strategic importance and it will help india in becoming indian ocean's predominant naval force thirdly it will lead to reduction in the navigation time if the distance is reduced then obviously time will also get reduced right it is one of the significance of the project fourthly this channel will become invaluable asset for the national defense and security as we already saw this will enable easier and quicker access between india's two coast this means indian coast guard and naval ships do not have to circumvent around sri lanka when commuting between the east and west coast see these are some of the advantages and significance of the project here let us take a quick detour and understand little bit in detail about the project as we already know the sedu samutram project aims to dredge a sea channel across the palk straits between india and sri lanka according to the project two channels will be created 
one will be created across adams bridge and the other will be created through the shallows of the park bay which will deepen the park streets this is all you have to know about the project although this project has so many advantages it is not without issues now as a part of this discussion let us see some of the issues associated with the sedu samutram ship channel project firstly computer models suggest that the central eastern and northeastern part of park bay may be impacted by waves of high energy once the project is completed this means that the area will receive more sediments once the project is completed because of the high energy waves this will make the area more turbid what does turbid means turbid means the area will receive more sediments and the light penetration through the waters will decrease as we all know turbidity is mostly considered detrimental to the corals and at the start of the discussion we saw adams bridge is nothing but shoals made of corals and if this project is executed the corals in the adams bridge would be affected this is the first concern apart from this we already know this area is vulnerable to cyclonic storms the classic example is the cyclone in 1964 the 1964 cyclone wiped out the entire town of dhanushkodi so if this project is executed then the storms that are occurring in this region can cause local sedimentary dynamics to go out of control and this is the second concern thirdly let us assume that we are dredging a channel then what will we do with the extracted sediments this is a big question so finding a safe place for dumping the dredged material is a big challenge that too we have to do it without harming the terrestrial and maritime ecosystem this is the third concern fourthly emissions from ships that are passing through the narrow channel will pollute the air and the water say if a ship carrying oil or coal is abandoned within the channel then it would cause a ecological disaster so ecological factor is also a concern and the next major concern of the project is the religious significance it holds we already saw that before right as per ramayana it is believed that adam's bridge was built by lord rama and his vanara sena the controversial factor here is the data given by researchers at the space application center in ahmedabad in the year 2003 space based investigations were done on the adam's bridge using satellite remote sensing imagery the conclusion of this investigation is that ram setu is not man made it comprises of 103 small patch reefs lying in linear pattern with reef crust sand case and intermittent deep channels here case refer to low elevation island situated on surfaces made of coral reef so the investigation said that ram setu is a linear ridge made of coral reefs it forms a shallow part of the ocean that is consistently impacted by sedimentation process The investigation also provided a theory for the existence of this shallow region. It all started during the global glaciation period that is during the ice age. It began around 2.6 million years ago and ended 11700 years ago. During this period the Indian coast including parts of Sedu Samutram must have been raised above water. And as we all know during the post glaciation period when the glacier started melting the sea level started increasing so many places in the world got submerged so due to the sea level rise the parts of the sedu samutram also got submerged during the post glaciation period and the coral polyps must have grown on the newly submerged platforms of the sedu samutram and this is how adams bridge must have been formed according to the research conducted by the space application center in ahmedabad but the religious people are not accepting this fact this is also another concern with the project see so far we saw about the sedu samutram ship channel project the importance and significance and the concerns around the execution of the project but did you notice most of the concerns are environmental concerns right do you think why so many environmental concerns are stated for this project why protecting park bay and gulf of mannar and the region around it is so important it is because of the presence of the coral reef platform in this region we all know how important coral reefs are right coral reefs support more species per unit area than any other marine ecosystem 
Coral reefs protect coastlines from storms and erosion. Many drugs are now being developed from the coral reef animals and plants. And these drugs in the future has the possibility of curing cancer, arthritis, human bacterial infections, virus and other diseases. Like this, we can go on listing the importance of coral reefs. Knowing its importance only, the coral reefs platforms between Dhanushkodi and Rameshwaram of Gulf of Mannar was notified as Marine Biosphere Reserve in the year 1989 itself. So, it is important to conserve the coral reefs in this region. Apart from this, as a part of a report, more than 36,000 species of flora and fauna live here. This region is covered by mangroves and sandy shores which are considered conducive for turtles to nest. Thirdly, this region is a breeding ground for fish, lobsters, shrimps and crabs. Out of the 600 recorded varieties of ships in the region, 70 are considered to be commercially important. So, this again makes it important to protect the sensitive nature of this region. See, these are all the reasons why Park Strait Gulf of Mannar region should be protected. When it comes to nature conservation, there is a term called geo heritage. Remember this. It is a key word that you can use in your main sensor. This geo heritage perspective is used to preserve the natural diversity of a geological feature. It says that natural heritage of a country include its geological heritage also. The value of the abiotic factors like geology, soil and landform is recognized in this geo heritage perspective. It is recognized because of its role in supporting habitats for biodiversity. And it accepts the fact that geodiversity is under threat from human activities and it needs protection. So, this project must be considered by looking at the Sedu Samutram area from a geo heritage perspective. See, already this area is threatened by discharge from thermal plants, brain runoff from salt pans and illegal mining of corals. And if Sedu Samutram ship channel project is executed, then it will be a final blow to the sensitive environment and livelihood of the people living here. Okay, so that's all regarding this discussion. In this discussion, first we saw about the Sedu Samutram ship channel project. Then we saw the significance and the importance of the project. After that, we saw some of the concerns around the project. Finally, we saw the ecological importance of this region and how by executing the project, we will damage the economical significance of this region. So that's all regarding this discussion. So with this, let us conclude this discussion and take up the next news article. See this article here. It says that Indian tech startup Ave Biosciences has launched Mito Plus. It is an indigenous state-of-the-art 3D bioprinter that can print human tissues. As per the article, it was launched at an event in Bengaluru last week. And the first prototype of Mito Plus has been installed at the Indian Institute of Science, Bangalore. This is about the news article given here. In this context, let us understand about 3D bioprinting from prelims perspective. So, what is this 3D bioprinting? 3D bioprinting is a form of additive manufacturing. See, we have covered additive manufacturing in some of our earlier videos. So, I am giving you an activity here. Interested aspirants in the comment section write what is additive manufacturing. Now coming back to 3D bioprinting. The term 3D bioprinting itself has its meaning. It comprises of three words. 3D meaning three dimensional. Bio means related to body or living and printing means making hard copy of something. So in this 3D bioprinting, the organic and biological materials such as living cells and nutrients are combined to create artificial structures that imitate natural human tissues. Know that these biomaterials are called bio inks and they mimic the composition of our natural tissues. Now, how does this work? The whole process of 3D bioprinting involves three major steps. The first step is pre-processing. See, this step involves the creation of a model and selection of raw materials to be used. The second major step is in processing. This is the major step involved in 3D bioprinting. This is where organs such as kidney and liver are printed using bio inks. The last step is post processing. In this process, works are done to maintain the stability, integrity and functions of the printed objects. 
So this is the basic schematic how the 3D bioprinting works. Here you have to know that 3D bioprinting works on the principle of layer deposits. Layers of bio inks are deposited on one another to create a different tissue like structures. The printed biomedical parts often aim to imitate the characteristics of the natural tissues. This is about 3D bioprinting. Now how is it different from 3D printing? See 3D printing is a generalized term. It involves printing of various materials such as polymers, plastics, ceramics, metals and even composites. Here 3D bioprinting refers specifically to printing of live cellular material. This is exactly why the word bio is added here. Finally before concluding let us see some of the applications of 3D bioprinting. First is reconstruction of body tissues. See 3D bioprinting is used to repair and reconstruct damaged tissues, tumor affected cells etc. Then the second major application is creation of transplantable organs. See in India every year so many people die because they are not able to find suitable donor. So using 3D bioprinting organs such as kidney, heart and liver can be created artificially. So this will address the shortfall in the supply of transplantable organs in our country. The third major application is organs for research. If we use human organs for research purposes, there is a concern of medical ethics. So, if the organs are 3D printer, this ethical crisis can be addressed. See, these are the major applications of 3D bioprinting. So, with this, let us conclude our discussion. What all we saw in this discussion? In this discussion, we saw what is 3D bioprinting, the process that is the three steps involved in 3D bioprinting. Then we saw how it is different from 3D printing. Finally, we saw the application of 3D bioprinting. With this, let us conclude this discussion and take up the next news article. Have a look at this text and context article. This article talks about the new data protection bill. What is this new data protection bill? What are missing in this bill? There are lot of questions that comes to our mind. Through this analysis, we will find answers for all these questions. First, I have highlighted here the syllabus that is regarding this discussion. You can go through it. Now, let's start our discussion. First, we will see what is this new data protection bill. The new data protection bill 2022 is a reworked version of the personal data protection bill 2019. Okay. Now, what is meant by data protection? Data protection is the process of safeguarding important information from corruption, compromise or loss. Here data is nothing but a large collection of information that is stored in a computer or on a network. The importance of data protection increases in the current time because the amount of data created and stored continues to grow at unprecedented rate right now. Okay. This is a brief introduction about data protection and data protection bill 2022. Before getting further into this discussion, I want to discuss some new terminology which will be used later as a part of this discussion. These terminologies are important because they could be asked in a pair based or a match based question in your prelims examination. Here first let us take data principle. Data principle refers to an individual whose data is being collected. And in case of children below 18 years of age, it is their parents or the legal guardian who will be considered as their data principles. So basically data principles refers to none other than the common people that is you and me are data principle. Now coming to data fiduciary. Data fiduciary is an entity that decides the purpose and the means of processing an individual's personal data. This entity may be an individual or a company or a firm or even the government. So, what is the example of data fiduciary? You can include social media sites like Twitter, Facebook, Instagram, all these are data fiduciary. Even our government which collects last of our data for issuing Aadhaar card etc. is also considered as a data fiduciary. Now moving on, what is personal data? Personal data refers to any data by which an individual can be identified. For example, my personal data will include my phone number, my email ID, my Aadhaar card number or even my birthday. Okay. The last important term that you have to know is the significant data fiduciary. Who are the significant data fiduciaries? Significant data fiduciaries are those who deal with high volume of personal data. Okay. And know that the central government which is processing a lot of personal data is designated as a significant data fiduciary. So, just remember these four terms 
which will be useful for our discussion also and it will be useful in your prelims paper also okay now moving on now let us see the purpose of this bill firstly this bill provides for the processing of digital personal data and note that the processing of the digital personal data should be lawful as well as fair to the individuals the second important purpose of this bill is that this bill ensures data minimization what is meant by this data minimization it means that a data fiduciary should limit the collection of personal information that is only directly relevant and necessary data should be collected and this personal data must only be used for the purpose for which it was collected okay and this data fiduciary should also retain the data only for as long as it is necessary to fulfill that purpose so basically if i am registering as a new user in facebook if facebook asks for my phone number and email id it is fine but if facebook asks for my aadhar number and bank account number it is excessive collection of data and it is against data minimization also when i quit facebook facebook should not retain my data okay it must delete my data from its profile okay this is about data minimization and it is one of the main purpose of this bill now moving on let us see what is the scope of the present formulation of the bill and what are the important provisions this bill lacks okay see this data protection bill applies to all personal data processing that is carried out digitally okay this include both personal data collected online and personal data that is collected offline but the thing is that these personal data that is collected offline should be digitized for processing so basically this bill covers only the data that is processed digitally and not manually so what are all the data which are processed manually are completely ignored by this bill this is one of the issues with the bill okay moving on see this bill covers processing of personal data which is collected by data fiduciaries within the territory of india so it seems to exclude data processing of indian data fiduciaries that collect and process personal data outside india and this would impact statutory protection available for clients of indian startups operating overseas okay this is a second major issue with the bill moving on this bill allows a data fiduciary to collect any personal data consented to by the data principal here it ignores the fact that certain kind of personal data is not relevant for the particular purpose for example a photo filter app may process data related to your location or information on your contacts these are not required to carry on its primary task which is applying a filter to a photo but it collects sensitive personal data this personal data should have been provided higher degree of protection but there is no such special distinction made in this bill although one of the main purpose of this bill is to ensure data minimization but in reality this bill does not ensure complete application of data minimization okay this is the third issue now moving on this bill also reduces the information that the data fiduciary is required to provide to the data principal information like the retention period of information source of information collected etc need not be provided by the data principal for example if i am registering as a new user in facebook facebook need not share with me how it is collecting my data and it need not share with me how long it will retain my data even if i deactivate facebook this provision is not covered in the bill and this is also an important disadvantage associated with the bill now moving on this bill limited the notice to only consent based personal data processing a notice is important for the data principal to exercise data protection rights this bill does not cover the right to know right to correction or updation and right to request for deletion as one of its provision okay this is also another major issue with the bill okay moving on to the next provision actually it is one of the positives of the bill the positive is that this bill ensures the right to post mortem privacy what is right to post mortem privacy right to post mortem privacy would allow the data principal to nominate another individual in case of death or incapacity this bill recognizes this right so this is an advantage associated with the bill moving on see this bill misses out on two main rights of data principal first is the right to data portability 
Now, what does this right to data portability actually mean? It is the right that allows the data principal to receive all the personal data they have provided to the data fiduciary. This right allows the data principal to be empowered because it allows them to choose between different platforms. Also, it enhances the competition between data fiduciaries to increase consumer welfare. Let me explain this with an example. For example, let us consider I have my profile in Facebook, but I am not satisfied with the working of Facebook. So I have decided to choose another social media, which is Twitter. So currently what I have to do is I must deactivate my profile in Facebook. Then I have to register again in Twitter by giving all my basic information. This is a little cumbersome process, right? Because in India, we do not have data portability. If data portability is enabled, I can just shift my data from Facebook to Twitter. So in one hand, I can delete my account in Facebook. But by using the information stored in Facebook, I can create an account in Twitter without having to add all my basic information once again. So this will be a easy way to transfer from one social media to another. See, if this is enabled, Facebook will be more cautious. It's because it does not want to lose its consumers. So this ensures competition between Facebook and Twitter to provide better welfare to us consumers. So data portability actually has many uses, but this bill ignores this data portability. Okay. This is the first right ignored by the bill. Now moving on, this bill also misses the right to be forgotten. See right to be forgotten can actually be understood just with the name itself. It actually means that if I have to quit Facebook or any social media, then the social media has to delete all the data that I have provided to it. And it also has to stop the processing process of all the data which I have provided to the social media. So this bill ignores both right to data portability and right to be forgotten. The next major issue associated with this bill is in relation to the personal data processing of children. See, like the previous bill, this bill also maintains the age of digital consent for children at 18 years of age. Here, age of digital consent means age at which an individual can consent to their personal data being processed. But this has major issues. The first issue is that since the age of digital consent is kept at 18 years, everyone below 18 years for accessing the internet has to get a confirmation from their parents and this will hamper their ability to access the internet. This is the first issue. The second issue is actually related to that because since it makes the access of internet difficult for the teenagers or people below 18 years of age, it would result in unequal access of internet. And finally, this provision would hamper autonomous development of children. Let me explain this third point with an example. Say my father is a deeply religious man, but in my teenage years, I want to explore atheism. So I want to read about Richard Dawkins, Periyar and Nietzsche. So to access information about them, I want to ask permission from my father who is a deeply religious man. Here what happens is my father will not give permission for me to read about these people. So this will hamper my autonomous development. My father will deeply influence my decision making. So by keeping the age of digital consent at a higher threshold of 18 years, the government is indirectly hampering autonomous development of children. Okay, this is a issue with the bill. Moving on, the new data protection bill allows for cross-border data flow to other countries and territories. And this should be notified by the central government. However, this bill does not provide a clear-cut guidance or criteria that has to be considered by the central government or the union government before making this notification. Since there is no written rules, it is at the discretion of the union government. And we know that everywhere where there is discretion, it is prone to be misused. Okay, this is another issue with the bill. Moving on, this bill reduces the scope of the proposed data protection board of India. Currently, there are 22 classes in the bill. In that 22 classes, the central government can make rules for 14 classes and the data protection board can make rules only in case of 8 classes. 
this is problematic because we already saw that the central government is a significant data fiduciary so the central government is playing both the role of data fiduciary and also a regulator so clearly there is a conflict of interest right so this might affect the privacy of millions of our citizens this is the first issue the second issue is that we saw the data protection board of india right the central government plays a significant role in the appointment of members of data protection board and also the terms and conditions and the functions of the data protection board so the central government can easily influence the data protection board so indirectly what the central government is saying that there is no one above the central government so no one can regulate the workings of the central government in case of data protection because already 14 clauses rules are made by the central government and also the data protection board is also under the control of the central government so clearly there is a conflict of interest here which must be addressed and this bill does not address this issue okay the next point is that according to the bill there is no storage limitation to government agencies this means that the government can continue to retain personal data for an unlimited period of time this can be done even when the purpose of processing is over and there is no legal requirement to store the data so basically there is no one to question the government regarding the storage of data beyond a limitation period okay finally let us take up the penalties that is provided in the bill firstly the bill places upper limit for the penalties at 500 crores and this is of much higher magnitude than that is provided in the personal data protection bill 2019 and this is actually a positive aspect secondly this bill does not create any new offenses this is another provision of the bill thirdly this bill does not allow the data principal to seek compensation from data fiduciary yes if uh, social media causes a harm to a individual due to unlawful processing of the individual's data the individual cannot file a case and get compensation or penalty from the social media okay this is the issue with the bill the fourth point is that the bill places duties on data principals that is if they are not compliant it could lead to a penalty of up to 10000 rupees okay so if the government is asking me to provide some data as a data principal it is my duty to provide the data to the government if i being negligent or ignorant of this i am liable to pay a fine of 10000 rupees so that's all regarding this discussion in this discussion we saw various provisions of the data protection bill 2022 while seeing this provisions we saw how this provision is a positive or what are all the issues with this provisions so it is very important just note down all the points you have seen in this discussion because it will be very helpful in your mains examination okay also we saw four important terms right as i already said these terms can be asked in your prelims examination also okay so with this let us conclude this and take up the next news article have a look at this news article this news article talks about conjunctivitis over 4000 people are getting affected by conjunctivitis a day in tamil nadu this is what the news has to say in this context let us learn about conjunctivitis briefly conjunctivitis is also known as pink eye it is an inflammation of the conjunctiva what is this conjunctiva conjunctiva is a thin clear tissue that lies inside the white part of the eye and it also lies the inside of our eyelids mostly it is the children who get affected by pink eye it can be highly contagious but it is rarely serious it will not damage the vision mainly if you find it and treat it quickly know that when you take care to prevent its spread and do all the things your doctor recommend pink eye clears up with no long term problems okay now the question is what causes pink eye it may be caused by viruses bacteria and then irritants such as shampoo dirt smoke or even swimming pool chlorine then it may be caused due to allergic reaction to things like pollen dust or smoke or it may even be caused due to special type of allergy that affects some people who wear contact lenses then even fungi amoeba and parasites causes pink eye among these the pink eye that are caused by virus allergic reaction and bacteria are the most common types okay i note that 80% of the acute cases of conjunctivitis are caused by adenovirus and the other common viral pathogens are herpes simplex herpes zoster 
and enterio virus then take the bacterial conjunctivitis it is far more common in children than adults and the pathogens responsible for bacterial conjunctivitis include staphylococcal species then streptococcus pneumoniae and haemophilus influenza and in children the disease is most often caused by haemophilus influenza streptococcus pneumoniae and morosella catarrhalis okay then the allergens toxins and local irritants are also responsible for non infectious conjunctivitis okay here know that conjunctivity sometimes results from sexually transmitted disease also here the important sexual transmitted disease that causes conjunctivity is gonorrhea see this is a serious form of conjunctivity and if it is not treated promptly it may lead to loss of vision okay with this basic understanding about conjunctivity now let us see the symptoms of conjunctivity the symptoms depend on the cause of inflammation and the symptoms may include redness in the white of the eye or the inner lid swollen conjunctiva more tears than usual thick yellow discharge mainly after sleep green or white discharge from the eye itchy eyes burning eyes blurred vision sensitivity to light and the last important symptom is swollen lymph nodes okay having seen the symptoms associated with conjunctivitis or pink eye now let us see how it can be diagnosed see don't assume that all red and irritated or swollen eyes are pink eye or viral conjunctivitis your symptoms could also be caused by seasonal allergies also so a eye doctor will ask you the symptoms and the eye doctor may use a cotton swab to take liquid from the eyelid to test in the lab this will help the doctor find whether the conjunctivitis is caused by bacteria or virus then uh, only after finding the cause of conjunctivitis the doctor will issue the prescribed solution okay this is because the treatment for the conjunctivitis depends upon the agent that causes conjunctivitis for example take viral conjunctivitis viral conjunctivitis is treated with antiviral eye drops and not with antibiotics okay see although we can take remedial measures once we contract conjunctivitis one of the important steps that we can take to address this issue is by taking preventive steps because we all know that prevention is always better than cure so staying clean will address the spread of conjunctivitis here i have listed some of the preventive measures that you can take to avoid the spread of pink eye so just go through it and try to follow it especially for students who are from chennai okay so that's all regarding this discussion in this discussion we saw about conjunctivitis the agents that causes conjunctivitis then we saw the symptoms the diagnosis and finally how to prevent conjunctivitis with this let us conclude this discussion and take up the next news article take a look at this article it talks about a review meeting chaired by the tamil nadu chief minister in which implementation of five different schemes were discussed the schemes were member of parliament local area development scheme the national health mission the integrated child development scheme the national food security act and the prime minister model village scheme this is what is given in the news article see we have already covered the first four schemes in various part of our hindu news analysis so today we will be focusing only on the pradhan mantri or prime ministers model village scheme see the prime ministers model village scheme provides for an adarsh gram where the village people are provided with access to various basic services these basic services are planned to be provided so that the minimum needs of all the sections of the society living in these villages are fully met and disparities are reduced to the minimum this is the explicit aim of the scheme now what is the implicit aim see implicitly this scheme ultimately want to create an environment in which everyone is enabled to utilize his or her potential to the fullest so this is about the aim that is the implicit and the explicit aim of the scheme now let us see the condition for the selection of the villages for this particular scheme the scheme aims at the integrated development of villages in which the population of the scheduled caste is above 50% so a village must consist of a population of scheduled caste which is more than 50% of the total population of the village to be eligible for the inclusion under the scheme 
this particular scheme comes under the ministry of social justice now let us see the primary objective of the scheme the scheme tries to develop 10 different domains at the village level these 10 different domains are drinking water and sanitation education health and nutrition social security rural roads and housing electricity and clean fuel agricultural practices financial inclusion digitization and livelihood and skill development this is what is the primary objective of the scheme so by achieving these primary objectives this scheme aims at creating a environment in which everyone is enabled to utilize their potential okay this is about the prime minister's model village scheme so that's all regarding this discussion in this discussion we saw the aim which ministry the scheme comes under how the village is selected and the objectives of the prime minister's model village scheme with this we have come to the end of the news article discussion session now let us take up the practice prelims questions let us take up the first question see it is a two statement question in regards to sansad adarsh gram yojana we have to find which of the two statements are incorrect before solving this question you must note that sansad adarsh gram yojana is different from the pradhan mantri village development scheme which we earlier saw in the discussion now coming to the first statement sansad adarsh gram yojana comes under the ministry of rural development see this statement is correct because it comes under the ministry of rural development if you can recall pradhan mantri village development scheme comes under the ministry of social justice okay moving on to the second statement under sansad adarsh gram yojana members of the parliament are tasked with the job of identifying villages in their constituencies to be developed as adarsh grams see this statement is also correct see the functioning of this scheme is inspired by the principle and the values of mahatma gandhi the scheme places equal stress on nurturing values of national pride patriotism community spirit self confidence and on developing infrastructure see here they have asked for the incorrect statement and as we saw both these statements are correct so the correct answer here is option d neither one nor two moving on to the second question see this is a three statement question three statements about the bureau of indian standards is given we have to find the correct statement let us take up the first statement bas is a statutory body see this statement is correct because in our discussion we saw that bas comes under the bureau of indian standards act 2016 moving on to the second statement bas comes under the ministry of commerce and industries see this statement is incorrect because bas comes under the department of consumer affairs which functions under the ministry of consumer affairs food and public distribution so statement 2 is incorrect moving on to the third statement bas is the only body in india to develop standards see this statement is also incorrect because there are numerous bodies present in india which fixes standards for specific domain some of them are food safety and standards authority of india for the standards on food safety then there is central pollution control board for standards on emission then there is central drug standards control organization which sets the standards for drugs and medical devices so here statement 2 and statement 3 are incorrect so the correct answer here is option a one only moving on to the third question this is also a three statement question three statements about conjunctivities is given we have to find the incorrect statement let us take up the first statement it is caused only by virus see this statement is incorrect because in our discussion we saw that this is caused by virus bacteria fungi amoeba and even allergic reaction so statement 1 is incorrect moving on to the second statement once infected it leads to loss of vision see this also is incorrect because in most of the cases conjunctivities or pink eyes are very easily treatable and does not lead to loss of vision we saw that only in case of conjunctivities caused by gonorrhea there is some probability of loss of vision when it is not properly treated so statement 2 is incorrect moving on to the third statement it results from inflammation of conjunctiva see this statement is correct conjunctivities results from inflammation of conjunctiva which is a thin clear tissue that lies over the white part of the eye and the lining of the inner eyelid so statement 3 is correct here they have asked for the incorrect statements so the correct answer here is option a 1 and 2 only see this is a quiz question for you today interested aspirants can write the answer for this question in the comment section 
The main questions based on today's discussion are displayed here. Interested aspirants can write the answer and post them in the comment section. If you like today's video, like, comment and share it with your friends. For more updates regarding UPSC preparation, subscribe to Shankar AS Academy's YouTube channel. Thank you for listening.